and Shabbat Shalom, everybody. As everybody scrambles to get their seats. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to Mishkan David Messianic Congregation here in Sunrise, Florida. My name is Esther Simkin. I'm the Rebetzin. That's a rabbi's wife. I'm the Rebetzin and praise and worship leader here. Shh. My turn to talk. I'm the Rebetzin and Praise and Worship Leader here. My husband is Messianic Rabbi Gabriel Simkin, and you're going to be hearing from him shortly. Um, and uh, I just want to welcome you if you're new, if you're tuning in online, and this is perhaps the first time you're visiting a Messianic congregation, whether in person or online. Um, we are, uh, what is a Messianic congregation? Messianic congregation is a congregation of Jewish and non-Jewish people who have come to the realization that Yeshua, that Jesus is the promised Messiah to Israel. This truth is a transforming truth because if you're of Jewish background, you begin to realize that it was, you realize that the Messiah has come, was the promised Messiah has come, that his name is Yeshua, Jesus, and that he will return again. And if you're not of Jewish background, then it's going to be transforming because you realize that he is, was, is, and will always be the Jewish Messiah, the Messiah to all of the world, but that the salvation came from Israel, that the greatest hope for peace came from the Middle East, and his name is Yeshua. And so this kind of truth transforms people, and it brings people together. And so in a congregation like this, and congregations like this all over the world, something very interesting is happening because a prophecy that God told the prophet Amos is actually coming to pass now. He said that before the Messiah's return, the tabernacle of David, which had fallen down, would be raised up again in the last days. And what does that mean? It means Jewish and non-Jewish people coming together, no longer divided. The house of God is no longer divided. They are coming together as one, united in the hand, in the, under the flag of Israel? No, in the hand of our Messiah, Messiah Yeshua. And that's why we're here together, to celebrate, not just worship, but to celebrate the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to worship him in spirit and in truth, and to follow the teachings of Messiah Yeshua, the one whom the world has always known as Jesus. His name is Yeshua, and he came, the word of God made flesh, dwelt among us. That's the fulfillment of prophecy. Because the sages knew that when Messiah would come, he would teach us how to walk out in Torah, how to walk out the laws of God so that we can enjoy blessings, not just salvation, but enjoy the blessings. And Messiah Yeshua did exactly that. And he did it by leading an exemplary life and teaching us by his own example how we need to live so that we know what it means not just to be saved but to be blessed so if you if you want to go f one step further than just being saved you really want God to show you some favor in your life and things to go well for you all the time and I'm just speaking from personal experience then this is this walk is about obedience it's about character formation not hearing every sing, obeying every single voice in your head, but does it line up with the word of God? Does it line up with what he said? Because Messiah Yeshua taught us exactly how, put, how to put into practice the word of God and how to discern when we are hearing from the voice of God or the voice of the adversary. Very, very important. So tonight I'm just going to be like your hostess this evening, and we're going to do the Shabbat table Friday nights. This is very... This is very um, common in observant Jewish household. This is a Shabbat table. And on the Shabbat table, we have uh, candles, we have bread, we have wine. And this is a communal experience. Some people call it a kind of communion. And so it is. Because the Shabbat table is a time when uh, observant Jews come together on God's day, his holy day, 
the Shabbat was his day. It is his day. We come together to rest in his presence, to rest and fellowship with him and fellowship with one another. And so you'll see that I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit how what goes on here at this Shabbat table. And, and, and this goes on in every observant Jewish household. So you might want to try this at home. I would highly recommend it. And we're going to talk about what a messianic Shabbat table is all about. A little bit different, very, pretty amazing. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to light the Shabbat candles. We keep all of the feasts of the Lord here in this congregation. And the, mo the first uh, of the, um, the feast that God instituted himself was the Shabbat. He sanctified this day. What does that mean? When you sanctify something, it means that you're separating it and making it holy and making it special. And the Lord took the Shabbat. This day, this 24-hour period, was his day. It is the only day on the Jewish calendar, the days of the week. It's the only one that has a name, Shabbat. If you look at the Jewish calendar, the weekdays are numbered. You know, Yom Rishon, Yom Shni, Yom uh, uh, Shishi, Yom Arba, Arba uh, Hamishi, the one, two, three, four, five. But the sixth day, the seventh day is the Shabbat. It's the only day on the weekly calendar in Hebrew that has a name. So it is a very, very special day. It is a time of rest. I would encourage you to put outside whatever your personal problems are because the Shabbat is about God himself. It's the one time when we remember for at least, at least 24 hours you put your own personal problems to one side, and you connect up with the one who is the eternal one. And remember what the center of gravity, who the center of gravity really is. And the Shabbat is all about that. So we're going to light the, I'm going to light the Shabbat candles. I'm going to be your hostess for this evening. I'm going to light the Shabbat candles. Usually it is the hostess of the home who lights the Shabbat candles. And uh, there are two candles. Uh, candles figure prominently in scripture, light figures very prominently in, in scripture. The temple uh, in Jerusalem was filled with light. It was very famous. All the menorahs were lit. It was filled with gold and filled with light. The, light, the candles of the menorot uh, never went out. They were lit 24-7. They had Levites priests who were in charge of constantly keeping it lit. The light, these, can these Shabbat candles is a symbolic gesture. It reminds us that we are called this didn't just begin with a Messiah, Yeshua. This mandate to be a light to the world, Israel was called to be a light to the nations. And so when we light the Shabbat candles, we are also not only welcoming the Shabbat, we are remembering what our mandate is before God. Because the Shabbat table is about who God is and what he expects from each and every one of us. So I'm going to light the Shabbat candles. The, of course, um, it is also, the Lord said that we would do uh, no work on the Shabbat for this 24-hour period. And, of course, in ancient times, just to keep a fire lit was a full-time job. So um, we light a Shabbat candle as a last act of work before the Shabbat, the last thing we do that's, that's considered laborious before this 24-hour period of rest. And I'm going to do that right now. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר קידישנו בדברו ונתן לנו את ישוע משכנו מצווינו לאות אור העולם. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe. You have sanctified us by your word, given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Bendito eres tú, Señor nuestro Dios, Rey del Universo. Tú nos has santificado con tu palabra, nos has dado a Yeshua nuestro Mesías, y nos has mandado ser una luz para el mundo. Amen. Um, interestingly enough, there are two candles. Uh, the, sa the ancient sages used to say that one candle represented the Torah, the other candle represented the prophets. Um, 
the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, has, has shown me many things over the years. Um, another way to look at it is this, is this represents the first and great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Messiah Yeshua said that on these two commandments hang all the Torah and the prophets. Um, and uh, also, I look at these candles and remember that Messiah Yeshua, our Messiah Jesus, defeated the adversary, adversary in Matthew chapter 4, uh, when he encountered him in the wilderness and he defeated him with the word, the teachings of the Torah and the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. So maybe the Holy Spirit will show you other things, the significance of two candles, two Shabbat candles. <coughs> the next thing that you'll see on a Shabbat table is the challah bread. The word challah simply means loaf, a, a yeast loaf, a loaf of bread uh, filled with yeast. Pardon me. Um, is called a challah. On Friday nights, they're usually sweet, because <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I can do all things through Messiah who strengthens me. <coughs> um, the challah bread is sweet on Friday nights because we are always hoping for a sweet Shabbat that we associate resting in the Lord, that the time of worshiping him in spirit and in truth, that this 24-hour period, considering and keeping God in our hearts, minds, and souls, and meditating on him, and meditating on the teachings of the Torah so that we can put it into practice, that this 24-hour period, we would associate it with sweetness, because God's words are always considered sweet. It is also braided. Um, no one knows who decided many centuries ago that this particular challah bread should be braided. But interestingly enough, it is three pieces of dough braided into one. For those of us who are messianic followers of Messiah Yeshua, we understand the reference. We see it. We see that our God is Echad, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Echad, a compound unity. And, the, and scripture says in John, these three are one. Also, <clears throat> we also remember that Messiah Yeshua was born in a town called Bethlehem. <coughs> hmm. Excuse me, I had a summer cold earlier this week. Um, those are always nasty. Yes, we still have summer colds. Um, and um, he was born in a town called Bethlehem. Now, in the, the name Bethlehem is familiar to all of us, but um, it's, it's, in English, it doesn't really have any meaning. But if you say it in Hebrew, Bethlehem, it means house of bread. So our Messiah, the Messiah Yeshua, who said that he was the bread of life, was born in a town called the house of bread. And so um, in, at the Shabbat table, usually the blessing is said over the bread. The head of the table will break off a piece of bread and give a piece to everyone at the table. And it is, again, an act of communion because we stand in solidarity. We are here to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we are here to observe the Shabbat. It is his day. And so in Shabbat observant homes, it becomes very important. So we're going to do that a little bit later. You, those of you who have go, gone ahead and taken elements, we do have elements back there. We have a little piece. Oh, thank you, Michael. We have little pieces of matzah that you can go ahead and help yourself. If you'd like to share in this, this moment of communion with us, uh, we use this piece of matzah because uh, we remember that our Messiah was sinless. And, excuse me, I'm not sad. It's just I cough, so it makes my eyes water. I'm just so happy. Uh, <laughs> um, no, it's okay. But yeast represented sin. So we like to use pieces of unleavened bread to remember our Messiah, who is the sinless one. So we're going to say the blessing over the bread. If you'll join me, it goes like this. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, chamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who issues forth bread from the earth. Amen. And let us never forget that Yeshua, our Messiah, is the true bread from heaven that a man may eat thereof and never taste death. So you may partake.
If you're here later on, we're going to be breaking this challah bread, and everybody's entitled to have a piece of challah bread and enjoy the blessing. If you're on cyberspace, I can't help you. Sorry, you'll just have to be in person. A good reason to come, right? As Rabbi says, this is not a correspondence course. <clears throat> the next thing we're going to do is we're going to bless the wine. This is a kiddush cup, and it's filled with sweet wine on Shabbat. This is also part of the Shabbat table, and it's a reminder that the Shabbat is a sweet time, a time of rest for our souls, a time of rest for our hearts and our minds when we focus on things that are eternal and leave aside the things that are temporary. And believe me, a lot of it is temporary. So um, we're going to say the blessing over the wine. And remember that Messiah Yeshua, our Messiah, he lifted a cup very similar to this at Passover, also known as the Last Supper, also called the, the cup of redemption. And he called it the cup of the new covenant when he lifted and he said the blessing, this is the blood of the new covenant. Because when he blessed this wine at Passover, um, he was establishing a new, the new covenant, the one that was promised. And uh, rabbis taught many times on that one. And I would encourage you to read Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And, um, and you'll see what the new covenant is all about and why it's important. And hopefully, you'll listen to some more of rabbis' teachings and you'll learn a lot more about it. So let's just say this, uh, this blessing or the wine. <clears throat> wine? Hello? The blessing over the wine? Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Borei pri hagafen Amen Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. As King David said, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord is sweet. You may taste. L'chaim. Another important part of the, the Shabbat of, um, of initiating this 24-hour period known as the Shabbat is the remembrance of the first and great commandment. The very first commandment that God gave the children of Israel, the one that is central to our walk, and the one that Messiah Yeshua again reinforced uh, again and again and said that that was the first and great commandment. These are our marching orders. This uh, commandment is recited by observant Jews all over the world, but for us Messianics, it's even more important because Messiah Yeshua said, this is the first and great commandment. And the second one like, would be like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And our Messiah said that on these two commandments hang all the Torah and the prophets. So we're gonna remember what the Shabbat is all about and who we are before our God and King. As you join me. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevot Malchuto Le'olam Ba'ed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. Amen. The next prayer we're going to say is the Kiddush prayer. And this is a special Shabbat prayer. It's a, it's a prayer that honors the God of creation. Because Shabbat is a time where it's exclusively devoted to honoring God, his greatness, and the fact that he is the creator of the universe. And especially, I think, now in the 21st century, here in the West, it becomes very, very important that we remember who God really is. Because I think we've gotten very casual about, about God and, and, you know, and very, um, uh, we trivialize our relationship with him. And we forget, yes, he is our father. Yes, he is a very individual God, but he is also the king. He is also the king. And when you come to a Shabbat service, you are here to acknowledge and worship the king of the universe and acknowledge that he is king, we are not, and he's not just some nice uncle that you can go borrow a lawnmower from, you know, on the weekend. That he is God, he is king, and that he is our creator. And that's what this prayer is all about. <clears throat> 
as we as you listen it says like this Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kitshanu bemitzvotav veratzavanu veshabat gotsho beahav avratzon hinchilanu zikaron lemaase vereshit ki hu yom tehilan lemikra kodesh zechel et yat mitzrayim ki vanu vacharta veyotanu ki dashta mikol amim veshabat gotshecha beahav avratzon hinchaltanu Baruch ata Adonai mekadesh hashabat Amen What did we say We said Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and wanted us to be his own. And with love and favor, he gave us his holy Sabbath as a heritage, a remembrance of creation. For that day is the prologue to the holy convocation, a memorial of the exodus from Egypt. For us did you choose and us did you sanctify from all the nations. And your holy Sabbath, with love and favor, did you give us as a heritage. Blessed are you, O Lord, who sanctifies the Sabbath. Amen. It's also worth noting that the Shabbat, before the Shabbat, there was no, no nation on earth that granted a day of rest to anybody that wasn't a king. Israel was the first nation on earth that gave all of its citizens, all of the citizens in the ancient world, a day of rest. <coughs> it is a sign that we are a free people. <coughs> because only free people were allowed to rest in the ancient world. And so God said, this is a sign between you and me. Now, the next prayer we're going to say is the refuah, which is a prayer for healing. If you are coming here seeking for healing, or if you maybe you want to pray for somebody else, you want to intercede, which is a very worthy cause, I would suggest <coughs> that you would um, make sure that your heart is filled with forgiveness, that you, you're not harboring any resentment towards anybody else because there's no place for that in your heart. You have no place, no business asking for mercy if you are not willing to show anybody else mercy. Because when you're asking for healing for yourself or for somebody else, you're approaching the throne of grace and you're asking for mercy. And Messiah Yeshua said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Just a little thought, because you got to give it to get it. So, and it goes like this. Rafainu Adonai ben Rafe, Hoshienu ben Ivashia. Heal us, O Lord, and we shall be healed. Save us, and we shall be saved. Ketehila tenu ata, for you are our praise. Behale refua shlema lechol makotenu, and bring complete recovery for our ailments. Yehiratzon mi fanecha Adonai Elohe, velohe avote. May it be your will, O Lord our God, and the God of our forefathers. Shetishlach mehe refua shlema min ha shamaim, that you quickly send a complete recovery from heaven. Spiritual healing and physical healing. For you are God, King, the faithful and compassionate healer. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, who heals the sick of his people, Israel. Amen. The next thing that happens on Shabbat is <clears throat> oftentimes in observant Jewish homes and certainly in synagogues you will hear the sound of the shofar. The sound the shofar is played is blown on Shabbat as a reminder that this 24 hour period is a very special one. It's a call to worship, it's a call to peace and it's a reminder that we are to put our earthly concerns to one side that this special 24-hour period was instituted by God himself and that it is his day and that we are to treat it as such with that kind of respect. As you listen to the sound of the shofar, I would also encourage you um, to call, if you haven't done it already, to call upon the name of Yeshua, the name above every name. Because he is the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Without him, there is no Shabbat Shalom. So if you haven't done it already, as you listen to the sound of the shofar, call upon the name of Yeshua, the name above every name. Incidentally, that's the name that's lifted up in this congregation, the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus, 
It's the only name lifted up in this congregation, the only name by which we can be saved. As we listen to the call to worship, the call to peace. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who separates the holy from the profane. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who grants us a Shabbat of rest, a, a rest for our minds, a rest for our hearts and souls, but not just a rest for our bodies, a rest in your presence, Lord, because without you there is no real rest. A time of fellowship where we can fellowship with you and fellowship with one another in surroundings that are free from interruption and focus on the eternity. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, keeper of promises, who kept the promise that you made way, way back at the beginning of time in Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, and you promised a fallen humanity that you would send to deliver a Messiah, a Yeshua, a Savior, to save the world from our sins, to save us from ourselves. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because you did exactly that, and you sent our Messiah, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus, who came as the greatest rabbi that ever lived, who came to teach us exactly how to walk in righteousness so that we can live not only saved lives, but lead blessed lives and know what true blessing really is. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because Messiah Yeshua taught us <coughs> excuse me, that true righteousness begins in the heart first, and that if you clean the inside of the cup first, then the outside would be cleansed as well. <coughs> Meaning that if we clean the spiritual, address the spiritual issues first, that then the physical issues that our bodies would follow and would respond in kind. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because you're going to send the Messiah again very soon, and he's going to be taking his rightful place on the throne of David in Jerusalem, at long last establishing your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, and at long last bringing about true peace on earth and goodwill to all men. As we enter into your courts with thanksgiving and with praise, we remember the psalmist who said, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to ever to all generations. As we enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise. <clears throat> Shabbat is a time of joy. It's a time of happiness. We celebrate the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We celebrate the fact that he made us a free people. And if you are a Messianic follower of Messiah Yeshua, of Jesus, are you a follower of Jesus? Did he save you? I can't tell. I don't know if you're happy or not. Okay, whatever. I'm going to celebrate and I'm going to worship our God and King because it is time to, for us, for me, to celebrate. 
Shout for joy to the Lord, worship Him alone. Come before Him singing joyful songs. Shout for joy to the Lord, worship Him alone. Come before Him singing joyful songs. Enter His gates with thanks in your heart and His courts with songs of praise. Give thanks to the King, rejoice and sing for His love and
a little incidental side note. So for those of you who are maybe tuning in for the first time or are visiting us for the first time, just so you know, I am not the entertainment. I'm not the entertainment. I'm not here to entertain. I'm a facilitator. I'm here to make it possible for you to worship God yourself. Because each and every one of us are called. If you're called by God, by God himself, then you are called to be a worshiper, to be a light to the world, to be an example for others of what a relationship with our Heavenly Father really is all about. And if you don't know what that's all about, then I suggest that you pay really close attention. But I am not here to entertain you. I am here to make it possible for you to put aside your personal problems because music is a, a, a lovely way of lowering your defenses and forgetting about your problems and entering to his courts with thanksgiving and with praise. And if you do that, God dwells in the praise of his people. He manifests himself when we praise him because when we realize that he is the center of gravity and that he is and we are not, then he moves in our lives. So if you're expecting a move from God, he's actually, he already made his move. He sent his son. He's expecting a move from you. The psalmist said, O oh Lord our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who has set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you might steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider, this is a classic Shabbat scripture, when I consider the heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands and you have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yes, even the beasts of the field. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We praise you. We thank you, Lord. You are, he is, the Alpha, the Omega, the Adon Olam, the Lord of eternity.
The psalmist said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Sing forth the honor of his name and make his praise glorious. Say unto God, how terrible are you in your works. Through the greatness of your power shall your enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to your name. Step down. 
The psalmist said, in just a moment of great joy, and I would imagine you were just feeling so overwhelmed, because when you have an encounter with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through the power of his redeeming Messiah, our Messiah, Yeshua, you are never the same after that. It is nothing short of overwhelming. And he said, as for me, you uphold me in my integrity and you set me before your face forever. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting and to everlasting. Amen and amen and amen. We praise you and we thank you, Lord. feel really welcome here. Share a smile, a word of encouragement. Enter his gates with thanks in your heart and his courts with songs of praise. 
to praise the Lord. Beautiful. Thank you, honey. Beautiful. Thank you, dancers. Anyone happy to be in the house of the Lord besides me? And I love what Yeshua said. What should we do when he says something? Shema, hear. He said, Matthew 18, verse 20, where two or three are gathered in his name. Can, can we say his name in Hebrew? Yeshua. He said, there am I in the midst of them. And I explained that the other day. That's powerful because in Judaism, unless you have 10 men, which is called a minion, you can't even open the Torah, you can't even really pray. And that makes it difficult. I mean, Yeshua said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So he said, two or three guys, you don't need 10. Made it easy. So we have two or three. He didn't even say it had to be men. Could be two or three ladies also, in the name of Yeshua. He said, there am I in the midst of them. And one thing God cannot do. I mean, oh, God can do everything except one thing. Can't lie. Don't you wish you could say that about yourself? Bunch of liars here. Oops. Aren't you glad you're under grace? I said last week, we have to be under grace. Because when the Holy Spirit came upon you and I, did you stop sinning? You see that? You have to be under grace. Because if you still sin after you're born again, he has to forgive you. Or otherwise he has to kill you. The day you get born again in the first sin, bam, bada boom. You're done. That's why. That, but Paul said, because we're under grace, should we sin? No. Don't you hate sin now? I hate sin. And I hate the, the father of sin. El Diablo. Don't like him. Hate him. Don't like him. And we'll talk bad about him tonight anyway. Because he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And hopefully none, none here will be a devouree. But anyway, we're in a place called Mishkan David. Mishkan means tabernacle. Tabernacle of David, of course, King David, Melech David. And he, of course, was king of Israel. When he was king of Israel, Israel was united. They were not divided. And, and they enjoyed some of the most prosperous time in history. And so what an awesome God. And God said about David, about King David, he said, that's a man after my own heart. He didn't say he was a perfect man because he wasn't. He did some shenanigans. Poor thing. But... God loved David, and David loved God. And you know that from the Psalms. If you read the Psalms, I don't know how people get religion reading the Psalms, because that's a man after God's own heart. That was a man that loved God and had a real relationship with a real God. And when you have a real relationship with a real God, you will be allergic to religion, like I am allergic to religion. For God so loved the world, he sent a theologian. God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. What does our Father in heaven want? He wants that special relationship with every, every person, father, son, father, daughter. That's special. When they asked him how to pray, Abba, our Father who is in heaven, that's what he wants. And when you realize that, and that's the kind of relationship you have with him, you will run away from religion. I've run away from it. I get, I, I get um, I'm allergic to religion. I break out in, in monkey pox. Whatever. I break out in hives. Another plague. Remember we said, if, if COVID is the first one and there's seven last plagues, if that's the first one, we got six more. If that's not the first one, we got seven more. So now you got COVID, now you got monkey pox. Oh boy. It's getting fun, isn't it? Hallelujah. Because Yeshua said, when you see these things, get depressed. He said, look up. When you see all these things, look up, because your redemption draws near. Hallelujah. I'm hoping to cheat the undertaker. 
Uh, we haven't made any funeral arrangements for us. We're just, we're trusting that we're just going to. We're going to be changed at the blink of an eye, just like wham, and, I, and, and the gray will be gone. <laughs> but anyway, we're in a place called Mishkan David, King David, the Psalms. So we're going to read a Psalm. Is that okay? We read a Psalm from King David? And then we'll pray? And then we'll talk about the star of the Bible. Him. He will be lifted up. Because when he is lifted up, when I'm lifted up, hmm. but when he's lifted up, he will draw everyone to himself. So let's read Psalm 82. That's what he put in my heart. I'm in such a good mood tonight, so you better behave. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Thank, thank you, honey. We've entered into his courts with thanksgiving. And with praise. And the Holy Spirit is definitely here. There's a presence. There's a shalom. There's a Shabbat shalom here. Enjoy it, right? And just joy. Psalm 82, only eight verses. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Abba, Father in heaven, we praise you. We thank you here tonight. We call upon you in the name above every name, the name Yeshua HaMashiach. The world knows him as Jesus the Christ. Father, we are here not to seek only your hand. We are here to seek your face, that your face would shine upon each and every one of us. Father in heaven, invade every bit of darkness with your light. Invade every bit of oppression with your love. Invade every sickness, every disease with your anointing, with your Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, we pray that there would not be one feeble among us like you did for the nation of Israel. Heal, restore, touch our brothers and sisters who could not be here tonight. Wherever they are, deliver them. Set the captives free. Let them come to your house. Let them brag about you, Father in heaven. And Abba, as we rejoice in our salvation, our names written in heaven, Father, your spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are your sons and we're your daughters. As we rejoice, our hearts go out to our family members, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, even our enemies. Father, and humbly ask you, draw them to yourself as you have done for each and every one of us. Let them taste and see that you are good. Let them have what we have. Let them experience what we are experiencing. Let their names be written in heaven. And Abba, Father, we thank you for giving us authority and power over all the power of the enemy to tread on them and that nothing by any means shall hurt us. We'll tread on them tonight in the name of Yeshua. We command every unclean spirit out of this place, away from our families, away from the Mishkan. This instant, in the name of Yeshua, we command you away from this place. Father, fill us Fill every empty vessel here to overflowing with your Holy Spirit in the name of Yeshua. Father, bless those watching on the internet. Bless them. Bless us. Lead us into all truth. Teach us not to live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. And Father, we thank you for every single thing that has happened in our lives to this very moment, knowing that all things do work together for the good because we love you and because you have called us for your purpose. Father in heaven, thank you for an amazing purpose to conform each and every one of us into the image of your Son, our Savior, our King, our Messiah, our Lord. In his name we pray tonight, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Yeshua HaMashiach. We pray in his name and the people of God said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. You know, last week's Torah portion 
Didn't have a lot of time to get into it, but if you read last week's Torah portion, what was it last week? What was the name of it? It was Pinchas. That God made a covenant of peace because he was zealous for his God. We were talking about being zealous for God. But towards the end of that Torah portion, God says, get ready for war. You're going to go into the promised land, and God is telling the nation of Israel, you're going to have to fight to get into the promised land. Now, could they have just walked in? Could God have just killed everybody and destroyed everyone who was in the promised land? They were the enemies of Israel and just gotten rid of them and they would just swept up the bodies. Could he have done that? Yes, but he didn't. Because all the things that happened to the nation of Israel, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, are examples for us. Our walk, his way, his truth, his life. Because if we don't understand these things, we get confused. I mean, I had a lot of confusion once the Holy Spirit came upon me. I didn't know what was going on. I was being attacked by the devil. Did that maybe that happen to you? A couple of weeks I had like a honeymoon. Everything was fine. All my prayers were answered. All of a sudden, wham! Angelic uh, uh, manifestation. Angelic activity. Most people don't even believe in angels. How many know that he made us a little lower than the angels? Which means there are angels. And when you're born again and you have the Holy Spirit, you will meet the angelic family. The only problem is not everyone is a good angel. There are some fallen angels. Revelation chapter 12. That make war. They make war. There was war in heaven, it says, according to Revelation chapter 12. So God allows Israel, get prepared for war. Because if we never heard of a physical war, how can you even know about a spiritual war? What war? What's a war? Like somebody would say, what's a war? Oh, how many people know what a war is? And war is hell. I, I, we don't like it. That's why Yeshua said, blessed are the peacemakers. Not the troublemakers. Because war is trouble and war is hell and people fighting and killing each other on a physical level. But now the, our, the Lord our God is teaching us in the Brit Kadashah and the New Covenant about a spiritual war. And if you don't understand about the spiritual war, you will get stuck with angelic activity in your life and you'll get stuck with the bad side of the angels. In other words, we, and I've been saying this for weeks now, Israel had a predetermined destination. The nation of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, they were going somewhere. They knew where they were going. As a matter of fact, they spied out the place they were going. Ten of the, of the leaders came back with a negative report. What happens when leadership has, has a negative attitude or a negative report? What happens to the rest of the people? They discourage the people. I mean, God forbid I should have any kind of negativity about our predetermined destination that someone would say, you can't have it. And I've heard that before. Because now as a child of God, as a born-again child of God, our predetermined destination is to be conformed to the image of His Son. And there's plenty of leadership out there that discourages the people. You can never be like Yeshua, they say. How many of us alive in the pit of hell? Those that received him, John chapter 1, gave he the power to become the sons of God. We don't want to listen to negative people. You can't have it. If God says you can have it, we can have it. Abraham believed God. You just got to believe what he says. And then, of course, you have believers that are non-believers. Crazy, huh? Don't call yourself a believer if you don't believe what Yeshua said. People call themselves believers. You're not, belie you're not a believer. You're a skeptic. You're a, you're, a, you're a chicken dressed as a sheep. I'm not even going to say a wolf because if, if you're a coward, if you say you can't, if you say you can't have it, you ain't even a wolf in sheep's clothing. You're a chicken in sheep's clothing. Feathers are coming out of your ears. There's plenty of chickens in the kingdom. 
I was around some of them. Oh, no, you can never be like that. Oh, no, you can't have it. Wow. As a matter of fact, they tried to tell me that I had, we had a different Holy Spirit. That we had the junior Holy Spirit. That we had the watered-down version. That we got the baby. We got the baby Jesus. A lot of people are stuck there. Negative reporting. I mean, you can't be around people like that. Show me a pessimist. I'll show you a loser. Yeah, you're nay. Love believes all things. Endures all things. We believe whatever. If God said it, we're not going to believe what God says. We're going to argue with God. Anyone here argue with God? You know what happens? You lose. Even when you think you're right, you're wrong. I argued with God. I thought I was right. I was wrong. Because he's the king of righteousness. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting. Psalm 82 says, you're God's. Yeshua said, whom the word of God came to, you are like a God. Not God himself, like God. You know why we're like God? Because we have eternal life now. Eternity is ours. If you're eternal, you're like a God now. But you can't be God. That's the lie from the pit of hell. We could be like God. We've been created in his image and his likeness. And when you have eternity flowing through you, you're no longer mortal. You're immortal. Are you with me? He says, if you walk with me, you won't walk in darkness. You'll walk in light. If you're with me, you'll never die. The same, and the same spirit, the Bible says in Romans 8, because people say, you believe in the resurrection of the dead? And I say, yes, of course I believe in the resurrection. Were you there? No, I wasn't there. So how do you know they didn't lie that Jesus rose from the dead? You know why I know he didn't, they didn't lie? Because the same spirit that raised him from the dead is raising me up from the dead every single day. I am a witness to the resurrection because the witness is within me now through the person of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? In other words, I'm enjoying eternal life, not when I die, now. And if you're not born again of the Holy Spirit, you're enjoying hell right now. What's hell? Separation from God. Enjoy your hell. Or I heard this one pastor say, what in hell do you want? We're enjoying eternity now. We're now eternal beings being lifted up to sit in heavenly places even though we were dead. That's what it says. We were dead. I was dead. You were dead too, right? You really did die. Tremendous testimony. Michael did die and, and went and saw heaven and saw hell from far away. Tremendous testimony. You know, called near-death experience where people come out of their bodies and they're like, we're not dead. How many people have heard that? Many people that have, that, that have had near-death experiences come out of their body. The, one of the first things they say, I wasn't dead. I was floating above my body. And that's what the Lord put on my heart many years ago. Because I how does this work? He says you walk. And when you die, you walk out of your body. And whatever road you're on, you just continue in that road. Ouch. You mean if I walk in darkness, it'll be greater darkness? Yes. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life. Only a few that find it. But if you're walking in the power of God, in the resurrection, in the Holy Spirit, and you're walking in light, even though you, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil. We're walking in light. We're walking in the Holy Spirit. We're walking in God. And when we leave our bodies, we'll just keep going. From good to better to best, or like the Bible says, from glory to glory. Yay or nay? Oh, I hope this gets you excited. Because gospel means good news. Death is not good news. 
Eternal life is good news. But you might as well start enjoying eternal life now. Taste and see that the Lord is good. We tasted hell, right? What does hell taste like? Terrible. Separation from God. Darkness. Oppression. Ugh. Like Yeshua said, where the worm dieth not. There's no rest. There's no peace in death. In other words, if, if you're going to, if you choose death, because God told the nation of Israel when Moses came from the, from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, he said, I set before you life and good and death and evil. And he said, choose. It's a choice. Life and death is a choice every day we make. I can go with God or I can go with the bad boy. Your choice. That's why it says, submit therefore to God. Resist. There's your war. There's your fight. Resist. 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 Where's he going? Lake of fire. Where does he want to take you and I? Lake of fire. If you let him lead you, he will take you to the lake of fire. And... I mean, I don't wish that, honestly, I don't wish that on my, my, my worst enemy. But anyway, Israel comes out of Egypt, they're saved, they go through the wilderness, they get stuck there, basically. They never make it to the promised land. That generation doesn't make it to the promised land. God is upset with them. He tells them in last week's Torah portion, get ready for war. You're going to have to fight to get into the promised land. How many know that we have to fight also? Paul said it. It is the good fight. What's the good fight? To fight with your, with your next door neighbor, your boss, your husband, your wife. Is that the good fight? That is a waste of time. What's the good fight? The fight of faith. The fight to stay on course to your predetermined destination. Just like Israel had a predetermined destination, we have a predetermined destination. If you're a child of God and you don't know what your predetermined destination is, you'll never get there. What's well, some of my favorite scriptures, Romans 8:28. And we know that all things work together for the good because somebody said, I love God. The minute you said you love God, the minute you, you declared yourself to love God, how I many know people say, I hate God? Or I don't believe in God? Crazy. But you said, I said, I love God. He lo you know, as a parent, don't you love to hear that from your children? They tell you, I love you. I mean, then you can have whatever I got. But if you demand, eh. But if my daughters come to me, oh, daddy, I just called to say I love you. You sure you, didn't have, you're not, you don't need any money? <laughs> I just called to say I love you. I'm like, oh, boy, that'll melt anybody. So we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. That's why people get confused. Because you think once you love God and once you turn over your life to God that it's your purpose. No mas. It's not your purpose anymore. It's his purpose. And the best thing you can do is to go with his purpose. Because our purpose, I mean, honestly, I had, I had all these wonderful plans and stuff when I came to the kingdom. All temporary stuff. You know, this, that, a business, it is, and that. You ain't not taking any of that with you. God has a purpose, not a temporary purpose for us, an eternal purpose. He's getting us ready for eternity. Yay or nay? That's why we're different. That's why we're strange. And like strange things happen to us. Things that don't happen to everybody else because they're not going where we're going. They're not training for eternal heaven. They're training for eternal. Yuck. You had to say that. Remember, I was, I was in a good mood. Let's keep it in a good mood. 
I don't wish anybody to go there. I really don't. So we're called according to his purpose. Now, don't go to the next scripture yet. Because when I heard this, and, and, and I heard many good preaching, because I love, I love to hear the word of God. When I got born again, I couldn't get enough of the word. I got words from the left to the right, up, down. I was so confused, it was like crazy. But anyway, a lot of people would say, God has this wonderful purpose in your life. And I was like, that sounds so beautiful. What is it? What is his purpose? Well, if you read the next verse, he'll tell you what it is. Look at what it says in verse 29. You'll know what his purpose is in your life. If you love him, if you don't love him, this message is not for you. If you love God, this message is for you. For whom he did, for, do you think he knew that you were going to love him before you loved him? You think he knew that? Of course he knew that. He knew that. He knew us before we knew him. Because he knows all of us. Amen? He knows every detail about us. For whom he did foreknow, he also did what? We love him. He foreknew us. And he did what? Pre what does predestinate mean? That we have a predetermined destination. Somebody say, we have a predetermined destination? Yes. God has made, God has given us a destiny. And it's predetermined. In other words, he's already telling us the end from the beginning. That's why he's called the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and he's the end. He'll tell you the end. He may not tell you the details of the in-between. You know why? Because you won't be able to handle it. Because it says all things work together. It doesn't say all things are good. There's some stuff that's not so good. And I want to stay in a good mood. I want to remember the bad stuff. Because I, when I read that, I said, oh, everything's going to be good. And I'm like, they're not good. Why are these no good things happening to me? Oh, all things are working together for the good. But not all things are pleasant. Anybody been through some unpleasant trees? Hmm. Yes, it all works together. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Yea or nay? For his predetermined destination. Because whose purpose is it? His purpose. What's our predetermined destination? To be. To be or not to be? That is the question. Yes, because there's someone who doesn't want us to be. In other words, just because you have the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you're going to be. Because there's someone who's anti-be. Yes, true. Just like they had to go to war to enter the promised land and fight, God would be with them. He told them, you will be successful. Because I'm going with you. Because it says those he called, he goes before them. In other words, because we're called, this is not a, a, a solo mission. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He's going with us through the person of the Holy Spirit on this mission. Yay or nay? Was he with them? Talking about Israel? Through the wilderness, was he with them? Never left him. Pillar of uh, smoke during the day. Pillar of fire at night. He was right there in the midst of them. Is he in the midst of us? Is he in us? Is he with us? Through the person of the Holy Spirit now. Yeshua said, you must be born again. And I, 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 as a little side note, to be born again, you really have to say to God, I want you and I love you and I want you in my life. It's kind of like a marriage proposal. Yea or nay? If you really want him, you got to tell him, I want you. I mean, the prayer to have God in your life is you're basically saying, God, I want you in my life. I'm inviting you to come into my life. 
Esther, I want you to be my wife. Esther, I want you to move in with me. Esther, I love you. Yay or nay? Do you love me? Wow. It's a marriage. We're married. Yay or nay? And of course you say, I'll never leave you or forsake you, and everybody lies. <laughs> Except God. Because he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. He never leaves. We leave. So when you're having a bad day, he didn't leave. You left. You left seeking him. You left your relationship with him. So our predetermined destination is to be conformed to the image of his son. Is that our predetermined destination? To be like the son of God? To be like the Messiah? To be like the anointed one? He's the anointed one who gives us the anointing in his name. Father will give you the Holy Spirit, he said, in my name. Yea or nay? There's the achad of God all answering to the name Yeshua. Father will give the Holy Spirit in my name. In my name, the Father will move and give you the Ruach HaKodesh. The Holy Spirit, yeah or nay? In case you're playing names, this name, that name, his name, who's on first, what's on second? The devil wants to confuse us. Father will send the Holy Spirit in my name. That's why Paul said, is the name above every name. Only name given under heaven where you can be saved. Yea or nay? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Brethren. Because if you're a child of God and you're conformed to the image of his son, that's a family. That's a godly family. Yeshua said, we are all brothers. And so, there's one father. Did he say this? Did he give us the family tree? One father. One teacher. One rabbi. And all ye are brethren. Say hello to your sisters. Hello, hello, sisters. Hello, brothers. Hola, como están? I'm your brother. Amen? You're my sister. How do you like the family? Our father who is in heaven, we have one father. I mean, like Yeshua said, this is my family. These, this is my family, the ones that hear the word of God and keep it. This is our family now. What about the say goodbye to them? If they don't turn, say goodbye. You're not going to see them anymore. They're not in the family. Sad, right? I, I don't want to think negative. It's so easy to go. <laughs> so easy to go kaput. Fight, war. It's a fight. It's a fight to make it to your predetermined destination because we're, to, we're predestined to become like Yeshua. So you think the adversary knows this? So the adversary is anti... What's he called? Anti-freeze? Anti-freeze? Anti-religion? He loves religion. He's not anti-religion. He's anti-Christos. Anti-Christ. Why is he anti? He's anti-Messiah. He's anti-anointing. He's very annoying. Why do you think he's anti-Messiah? Because he doesn't want you and I to become. Yeah, your name. There's your enemy. There's your adversary. There's who you're up against to reach your predetermined destination. In other words, you got to get through him 
in order to make it to your predetermined destination. What happens if you don't get through him? You're stuck. Where? The same place Israel got stuck, in the wilderness. And I'm not saying you're condemned. I'm just saying you're stuck. You're stuck between a rock and a hard place. You're in between. It's kind of like purgatory if there's such a thing. You're stuck in the middle. You're out of Egypt. You're saved. I know, I know many brothers and sisters that are saved that are stuck. They can't get past the anti. And you got to face them down. Yeah or nay? Yeshua said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Go with me to Matthew 3, please. Are you with me? Everything we say has to be backed up by the word of God. We don't make things up here, by the way. If you can't back up with the written word of God what you're saying, you, 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 you pulled it out of your elbow. We're not pulling anything out of anywhere here. Verse 16, uh, Matthew 3, 316. Yeshua, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Ruach of God, the Spirit of God, descending like a dove and lighting upon him and lo a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased chapter 4 then was Yeshua led up straight into the promised land come on brother we're born again you have the Holy Spirit you have the promises of God I'd... wait a minute if he's the way the truth and life, what happened after the Holy Spirit came upon him he was led of the spirit where same place. But now he would be tested not on a physical level. He would be tested on a spiritual level. Because when you're born again of the Ruach HaKodesh, of the Holy Spirit, you've been raised up to sit in heavenly places. Even though you were dead, with tre time to meet the angelic family. Time to have angelic manifestation in your life. If you want to if you want to know angels, get born again of the Holy Spirit. You will meet angels. But first you're going to meet the dark side of the family. Dum ta dum dum. Dum ta dum dum. I didn't believe in no angels. I didn't believe in any of this stuff until I received the Holy Spirit. Then all of a sudden like Whoa, mamma mia. Me and I started talking Italian. <laughs> so then was Yeshua led up of the Spirit in the, to, into the wilderness to be who? Tempted. Now, if he's our teacher and he's our leader, if he didn't make it through this, do you think we, we have a chance? That's why you got to pay attention to the teacher, to the master. How did he get through this? Because if you don't get past the bad boy, you may not get the, you may not get the good side of the family for a while. You may be stuck. I'm just putting that out to you. I'm not questioning your salvation now. Don't say, Rabbi Gabe condemned me. No, I said you're stuck. How many of you can be stuck? Israel was stuck 40 years. Is that, would you say that's stuck? Then was Yeshua led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested of the devil. Yea or nay? In other words, who is the anti? What's his job? To stop you from your predetermined destination. What happens if he stops you from your predetermined destination? You're going nowhere in the kingdom of God. Didn't you pray to the Father and you said you wanted, you really wanted to move up in the kingdom of God? Uh, you want promotion? Most people like promotion. Some don't. If you don't like promotion, stay stuck. This message is not for you either. If you don't love God, this message is not for you. If you want to stay stuck, this message is not for you. These are people who don't want to be stuck. Well, how do I get unstuck? You've got to get past him. Now, he's no, uh, what's the word I want to use? 
He's no, like, you know, wimp. He's a formidable adversary. In other words, you got to get past him. you got to take notes here now. How do I get past Mr. D. E. Ville? Let's see how Yeshua, the firstborn among many brethren, how did he get past him? Amen? So, verse 2, how did Yeshua prepare himself? When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungry. In other words, how did Yeshua prepare himself to meet the adversary? He fasted. What does fasting do to a child of God? It neutralizes the flesh or crucifies the flesh. In other words, that's not your main goal. Your main goal in this walk, if you're, if you're going to your predetermined destination, this is not a flesh walk. This is a spiritual walk. Are you with me? Yeshua said, pick up your cross and follow me. In other words, this is, I'm not taking you on a flesh walk. Your predetermined destination is not a place. Your predetermined destination is a spiritual reality. Your predetermined destination is to walk in this power and this anointing that God has given you. And the anti-anointing is going to come and try and stop you. And you better have some fight in you. Because if you lay down, he will walk all over you. Now the Bible says that those that received him gave you power. He says, behold, I, I, I beheld Satan fall from heaven. Yeshua tells you he's a fallen angel. He's a fallen being, right? We've read that many times. Keep your finger here in Matthew 4. You're giving me holy looks. I don't like that. Like what the heck is he talking about? Luke 11. Luke 10, verse 17. The 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And he said to them in verse 18, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. In verse 19, here it comes. Behold, I give to you power to tread on them. Footnote. Either you tread on them or they tread on you. Take your pick. Somebody say, time to fight. Because if you don't fight the good fight, if you don't know who you're up against, they will walk all over you. They will walk all over you. And Yeshua said he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. If you let him walk all over you, he will destroy your life. He will destroy everything around you. He's a destroyer. He doesn't care. He's condemned. What has he got to lose? I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, verse 19, Luke 10, and over all the power of the enemy. Over all the power of the enemy. In other words, the enemy, the only power the enemy has is what you give him. Are you with me? Peter, let me give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You want, you want to give power to the devil? Loose him. You don't want to give power to the devil? Lose him. Bind him. Don't give him a foothold. Don't give him anything. Fight! Fight the good fight. I got to wake some people up here. I don't feel like fighting. It's Shabbat. Can't we just have some shalom? Can I just hug my blankie? This crazy rabbi here talking fighting and war. It is what it is. Yay or nay? Tell me you haven't already. The adversary hasn't harassed you. I give you power over all the power of the enemy and nothing, no thing shall by any means hurt you. But you got to stand up to him and you have to exercise the power that he gave to you 
to tread on them because if you don't tread on them, guarantee they will tread on you. Yea or nay? And come on, we're all good fighters here. Come on, don't act like it was just like some new. You fought. You fought with people. You, you, you fought. You fought flesh and blood. Come on now. You got into fights. You got a black eye here and there, didn't you? Somebody punched you or pulled your hair if you're a girl. You fought. You know what fighting is about. All waste of time. We're not up against flesh and blood. We're up against spiritual wickedness in high places. Yea or nay? I mean, he, in verse 20, it's worth reading. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. He's already telling you you have eternal life. He's already telling you you've been raised up to sit in heavenly places. It's just a question of learning how to fight the good fight and who you're up against and why he's coming against you and why he's trying to stop you. Because come on now, let's reason. Like I told the Lord, you know, what can one person do? Look, a little fat Jewish boy, what can I do? One person. You know, how many of the devil wants to minimize and make us insignificant? You're worthless. You're no good. You're, you're good for nothing. That's how the adversary talks. But then the Holy Spirit, you know what he said to me? Look what one person did. Hello, skinny little Jewish guy. Name Jesus. Name Yeshua. No business, no money, no place to stay. He kicked some devil to us. Somebody said we need to listen to him. Because if you don't get past this, the Holy Spirit put on my heart tonight. If you don't get past the bad boy, you're not getting to your predetermined destination. Just like they didn't get to their predetermined destination. Same problem. And, and that's, what I was, that's what I wanted to say. The devil cannot afford for one of us to be like Yeshua. Cannot afford one. Because look what one did. Imagine two, three, cuatro. Oh my God. A room full of people here like Yeshua. Oh my God. This place would be famous. We're not so famous. Because Auntie... He put the, he put the, the kibosh on you. Because he doesn't want you to become like Yeshua. Come on now. So he fasted. I've never fasted before. Good time to start. Somebody say, I'm preparing myself for the fight. See, in a physical fight, you'd eat food, you'd exercise, you'd get your muscles ready, you're, you're ready to go. In a spiritual fight, that, that's useless. Not a physical fight. How do I get ready for a spiritual fight? Sierra la boca. Get out of the flesh because you're going on a spiritual walk and you're going on a spiritual fight. Yea or nay? Yeshua knew he was going to get into a spiritual fight. What did he do? Out of the flesh. And he was already skinny. Yea or nay? The best diet for a believer is prayer and fasting. So when the tempter came to him, verse 3, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. In other words, the first anti-move that the devil made, think about it this way, here comes the first anti-move. What's the first anti-move? Eat. Flesh. Feed your flesh. He's a flesh devil. I want to get past the devil. Stop thinking about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to live. Because if you're worried about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to live, what are you? Carnally minded. What happens when you're carnally minded? Romans chapter 8. Death. 
In other words, we got to get past this bad boy because we're going to our predetermined destination. In other words, he's going to appeal to the flesh, and I'm going to tell him, it is written, Satan, get thee behind me. It is written, man shall not live by bread only, but by every word. He just quoted to him out of the Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. In other words, i got to get past Mr. D. E. Ville. What must I do? Don't live by bread only. That's the answer. The first, the first pass through the anti. You just put anti behind you. If you can't get out of the flesh, anti is still in your face. You're not getting there yet. He's still in your face. He's not behind you. If he's not behind you, he's in your face. If he's in your face, you're not going forward. Yea or nay? Interesting? True? So the first anti-move that the devil makes is to get you in the flesh. Somebody say, time to get out of the flesh. Time to think more about God than the flesh. Yea or nay? That's spiritually minded, life and peace. Yea or nay? All right, you made it to the first uh, roadblock. You know what the Holy Spirit's showing me? Most brothers and sisters don't make it past the first road. They don't even get to first base. They're stuck on first base. Food. Eat. In Jesus' name, I want a bunch of money. In Jesus' name. Those are the churches that are filled today. Carnally minded. I mean, it's the first, I'll call them the first base church. You know, like a first whatever. You're the first base because you ain't never getting past first base thinking about food and money and all the carnal stuff. Yay yeah or nay? First base. First obstacle. Somebody say, we got to get past the first obstacle. We're going to our predetermined destination and you got to know how he works, the adversary. You got to know what you're up against. You got to know how he comes at you. You got to know how people fail because many have failed, and I'm not, I'm not calling you a failure. Yes, I am, but I don't want you to fail. I'm like the drill sergeant here, you know. I'm here to encourage you. I don't want you to fail. I don't want to fail. I don't want my wife to fail. I don't want my brothers and sisters to fail. I want to see you succeed. You know what happens when you succeed? Your face looks much better. You're like, ha, ha, I got past the anti. Amazing, amazing predetermined destination. Oh, my God. I've never had it so good. Instead of you walking in here like, <laughs> could you pray for God to send me a couple of bucks this week because I'm hurting? You know, you're walking around like you lost your wallet. That ain't good. And that's not good advertising for the kingdom of God. Yea and nay. Doesn't that say we're more than conquerors? Time to conquer. Time to fight the good fight. Time to get past the obstacle course. First obstacle. Somebody say get past it. Now, does that mean we don't work and stuff like that? Yes, we, we work to live. We don't live to work. You know, I, I, I work to, you know, how many frijoles can you eat? You know, how many beans and rice? And I mean, look, look at me. How much more could I eat? I have all this food and I can't eat it. I have all these clothes and I can't wear them all. I got a walk-in closet. You know what? That, I trip over my own shoes. I got so many pairs of shoes and clothes. It's like, I look at my closet and I'm like, man. Yeshua had one set of clothing. So Yeshua got past the flesh in verse 4, past the first obstacle on his way to his predetermined destination. Then notice what it says, verse 5, the devil took him up into the holy city and sent him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning you. And in their hands they shall bear you up less than any time you dash your foot. In other words, hurt yourself. 
So if he can't get you in the flesh department, what's the next obstacle? Hurt yourself. Angels will bear you up. He's quoting scripture. Now the devil's quoting scripture back to Yeshua. Oh, you want to play scripture? Let me quote Psalm 91 verses 13 and 14 to you. Because that's what it says. That's what he just quoted to him. So now, so now next, hurt yourself. <laughs> oh, you gave me what you had. We are one flesh. Can I have some water, please? We share everything. So what's the next obstacle I must get through? I am not going to hurt myself. I am not going to hurt myself. Say it out loud. Because we hurt ourselves, let's be honest. We do things to hurt ourselves. We do things that are harmful to us. I'm not even talking about other people. We do things to harm ourselves. If you can't say amen, say oh me. If you smoke cigarettes, you're hurting yourself right now. Yay or nay? Plenty of brothers and sisters puffing away, right? What are you doing? Killing yourself. Yeah, your name. I'm cool. Yeah, you're cool, all right. Go ahead, keep smoking. You look so cool. You look so cool with an oxygen tank. Who was it that just died? David Soul? From Starsky and Hutch? How many remember Starsky and Hutch? Yeah, it was David Soul. Oh, it was Tony Dow, from the guy from Leave It to Beaver. But David Soul stroked out, cancer, they removed his lung, smoked for 50 years. What did he do? Hurt himself. Because I, I read this bio, 50 years of smoking. So the devil took him up into the holy city and sent him on a pinnacle and gave him a pack of cigarettes and said, puff away. Don't worry, angels will take care of you. And Yeshua said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. I'm not going to hurt myself. Somebody say, I'm not going to hurt myself. Because if you're going to be in the Holy Spirit business, it's not about hurting yourself or hurting others. It's about helping other people. If you hurt yourself, what are you going to do? It's like, physician, heal yourself, the Lord said. If you're, if you're damaged goods, how are you going to help somebody else? If you think about it. Yeah, you're not. And I'm not saying this to put anybody down. I'm saying we're on our way to our predetermined destination, and there's an anti that's against us. And look at the stuff he's doing and what he's saying and how he's saying it. And many of us already fall into this category right now. And you got to get past this stuff because otherwise you can't get past him. And if you don't get past him, you're not going to make it to your predetermined destination to be conformed to the image of his. So as Yeshua said, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So again, the devil took him up. Again, the devil hasn't given up yet. Verse 8. So if, if he can't get you in the flesh, he'll get you to hurt yourself. So again, the devil took him up to an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and, his, and the glory of them. And he said to him, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. I will give you glory in this world. You know, now what is he working on? What is he working on? Pride. Pride. To the, your pride. Oh, I want to be famous. I want everybody to know me. I want, I want, I want every, I want to, I, I want to be a star. I want to be a movie star. I want to be uh, this, you know, I, I want to, I want to be famous. So he will appeal to your pride. I'm a nobody. How many people are ready to say that? I'm nothing. I'm a nobody. Without God, I'm nothing. I mean, those that humble themselves 
uh, he, he's going to lift up. The pride, he resists the proud. So the devil's coming after your pride. He wants to lift up your pride. Yeah or nay? If he can't get your flesh, he can't get you to hurt yourself, what's he going to appeal to? Pride. I mean, I know I'm hitting on some bases here. Because that's how he's working on all of us. I mean, that's, he was coming at the master with this junk. You think he was coming at the master with the stuff that doesn't work or the stuff that's been working for him for centuries? He was, I would venture to say, he was throwing the, his best at him. He was throwing his best at him. And you got to see what he was throwing at him because he's throwing the stuff at us. If you can't say amen, say oh me. And some of us are stuck here in these places. And you got to get past him. He's the adversary. He's the anti-anointing. He's the one that wants to stop you from becoming. And look, what he's, look, what he, look how he's trying to stop us and what he's using. In other words, if you know how he's coming at you, then you know how to resist him. You know how to fight him. Yay or nay? I love this stuff. And said to him again, verse 9, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Yeshua said to him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Deuteronomy 6 and 13. In other words, he will give you worldly fame. But where is that going to get you? Because doesn't it say, if you love the world, if the love of the Father is not in you? If you love the world, you don't love God. And, and it says, if you love God, for those who love God, He's taking us to a predetermined destination to be conformed to the image of His Son. And the anti-Son is throwing all this junk at us. And if He hasn't already thrown this junk at you, you just got started. But He will. Maybe he's thrown all three at you already. In one way or another. If you've been in the kingdom of God for a while, we've been in the kingdom, tell, tell me he hasn't thrown all these things at us. Every one of these things. How many people say, he's thrown all this stuff at me already. Come on now, admit it. Because that's how he's trying to stop us. That's what we're up against. That's our adversary. We're almost there. Go with me to 1 John. Are you interested? Somebody say, I'm getting something here. You got to fight. Somebody say, it's a fight. Basically here, I got to fight my own flesh. I got to fight hurting myself. Think about it. And I have to fight my pride. Like, I don't need to be famous anymore. I don't need to be rich and famous. I just want to go to heaven because what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what would you trade for your soul? All the fame in the world isn't worth temporary life. Yea or nay? I have to fight all those things. That's our reality. I'm not staying here. I'm going. I'm going. And it doesn't matter what he throws at me. I'm just going to resist him. I've learned to fight him and nobody else. I don't fight my wife. What's the point of that? She can't give me eternal life. She could kill me, but, you know. I love you, honey. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. 1 John, not the gospel, the letter of John. Uh, page 1297 in my Bible. There's a lot of pages here. Little children, verse 18, chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard, the who is coming? He's anti what? He's anti my predetermined destination? He is anti my pre determined he is anti your predetermined destination first john 2 18 you see it first john you there you see it you can look at that on the screen little children it is the last time and as you have heard that anti-mashiach anti-christos 
shall come, even now are there many. In other words, it's not just one. He got friends. Tiene amigos. He's got friends. Many anti what? He, they're anti my predetermined destination. You mean I'm up against an angelic army of fallen angels? Yeah. And what's their job to stop you from becoming? Aren't you glad they couldn't stop you from being born again and saved? Aren't you glad? They tried that, didn't they? They tried that on me. I got past that. But then I thought it's over. No, it just started. Now you got to keep going. I got to get past the ante so I can get to the, my predetermined destination. And, it, and, it, and it's me and the Lord. He's in me and he's with me. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He's going with me. He's called me. He goes before me. I'm not alone in this fight. They were not alone in that fight. When he told them to go fight, they weren't going by themselves. He was going to be with them. Remember Joshua? Somebody showed up dressed in full gear. And Joshua said, are you for us or against us? Good question. For you. In other words, angelic protection. We'll get to that in a minute. Whereby we know that it is the last time, verse 18, the last part. Verse 22, skip down to verse 22. Who is a liar? But he that denies that Yeshua is the Messiah, he is the anti-Christ or anti-Messiah that denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son, verse 23, the same has not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Oh, let's keep this good stuff. And this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life, verse 25. And these things I've written to you concerning them that seduce you. There's the anti again. What is he trying to do? Seduce us. Of course. But notice what it says. But the anointing which you have received of him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie, even as it is taught you, you shall abide in him. In other words, in order to get to your predetermined destination, it's not earthly teaching anymore. It's not earthly teachers. I cannot take you there. I can encourage you, I can point you, I can tell you what your predetermined destination, but it's you and the anointing going yourself with him. Amen. And it's your fight, just like it's my fight. And you got to fight for it. And you got to want it. And you got to be prepared, because it is a war. If he made war in heaven, Revelation 12, he's making war here. And it says he makes war with who? Who does the devil make war with? God said to Israel, prepare for war. Yeshua says, prepare for war. Who are we fighting against? Each other? Who, who are we up against? What, look at Revelation 12, the last verse, 14, 17, whatever the last verse is in Revelation 12. Who does he make war with? The last verse. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war. This is a war? Who's he making war with? The remnant of her seed, which do what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua. Somebody say, it's a war. Does he want us to keep the commandments? No. No. And, and, and whoever doesn't keep his commandments, now go with me to chapter 4 in 1 John.
Beloved, believe not every spirit, verse 1, but try the spirits where they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Yeshua the Messiah is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Yeshua the Messiah is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of, there he is again, anti-what? Whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. It, he was in the world already 2,000 years ago. You're of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and His love is perfected in us. And hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever shall confess that Yeshua is the Son of God, God dwells in Him. And he and, and he and God, and we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can, we, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he also, that he who, love God, who loves God, love his brother also. Are you with me? Amen. Now go back, go back to Matthew 4. What happens when Yeshua gets past all the obstacles of the anti-Messiah? He's on his way. Somebody say, we're on our way. What happens if I get through the anti-Messiah? Look what happened to him. Look what happened to him when the adversary could no longer stop him. He tried to stop him. Notice what it says in verse 11 in Matthew 4. And we're going to close with this verse. Then the devil left him. When will the devil leave you? When you resist him when he cannot touch you in any way, shape, or form, he's going to have to go look for somebody else. And I'm not wishing him on anybody else. But I don't want him in my life. I don't want him appealing to my flesh. I don't want him appealing to hurt myself. And I'm not, I'm not going to be lifted up with pride. I want none of those things. I don't want to give him any kind of foothold. I want to submit to God. I want to resist the devil. And he will what? He will flee. What happens when the devil flees? What happens when I get past the devil? Then what happens? Then you meet the other side of the family. Then what happened? Behold, angels came and ministered to him. In other words, I resisted the adversary. They left. And somebody else came into my life. Not only the Holy Spirit, but ministering angels on my side. Somebody say, time to get past the devil. Time to get past all the obstacles. We're going for a predetermined destination. And I'd love to have an army of angels around me, ministering to me and ministering to others around me. In the name of Yeshua, let's stand up and honor him, please. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I'm in a good mood. To tread on them. Somebody say, time to tread on them. I don't like them treading on me or you. 
How's he coming at me? You saw how he came at Yeshua. Somebody say, I see how he works. I see how he works. So when he comes at you, you'll say, ha ha. We talked about it. We're ready to say, get thee behind me. Like my mother used to say in Spanish, Satan, get in my behind. And I would say, mom, don't say that. It was funny though. She tried. Mom, don't tell him to get the near behind. Modern English, Satan, get out of my face. Satan, I'm going for my predetermined destination to be conformed. To be conformed. Somebody say, to be conformed. God accepted me deformed. Did he accept you in your condition? Does he want to leave you there? Does he want to save you in Egypt or out of Egypt? Does he want to leave you in the wilderness? Or does he want to take you to your predetermined destination? For them it was the land of Israel. For us it's the God of Israel. To be conformed into the image of his son. Who's the son of God? Melech Israel. The King of Kings. And, oh, I'm getting the Holy Spirit rush. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He cannot afford one of us to make it. He attacks every single one of us. Vehemently. And he don't give up so easy. Come on now. Somebody say time to tell him to get lost in Yeshua's holy name. Somebody say, let's, let's say that together. Get thee behind me in the name of Yeshua. We command every unclean spirit. You're not stopping this group. This group's going for it. I see Julia. She's ready to fight. They're ready to fight. Come on now. She's ready to go for it. Come on now. You better tell Scotty. He's watching, right? Or he fell asleep, I don't know. <laughs> Scotty, wake up and listen. He's, he's tired, mommy. Hallelujah. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you. Bless your holy name. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Father, thank you because we love you. Because you foreknew us. Thank you for this amazing predetermined destination for each and every one of us. To be conformed to the image of your Son, our Messiah, our Savior, our Adonai, our Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Bless the name Yeshua. Bless the name Yeshua. Bless your Holy Thank you, Lord, opening our eyes. We're hearing. Father, let these words fall on good ground. Hearts that understand. Hearts that bring forth much fruit. Oh, hallelujah. You know what I'm hearing in my spirit? Flesh. A lot of us are stuck on that first one. The flesh. The flesh. This is not a flesh one. Those that, those that walk in the spirit shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Father in heaven, thank you. We praise you. Bless your holy name. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your direction. Thank you for taking us. Thank you for leading the way. Thank you for winning the battle for us. Thank you for showing us how to win the battle. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Show us how to be more than conquerors. Oh, Baruch Hashem, a million times. Bless his holy name tonight and forever. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the world knows him as Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray. And the people of God said, 
Amen. Give the Lord a big hand. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching on the air. Now we're closing worship and the bedtime Shema. Love it. service is dismissed tonight. I just want to encourage you um, to be here tomorrow morning because tomorrow we have our Taurus service. So we hope you'll be a part of it and, um, and, uh, and maybe get something out of the scripture reading for the week. The, the rabbi expounds on the scripture reading for the week and it's always, always extremely relevant. So I hope you don't miss out. Um, our services are not alike if you're tuning in for the first time. Our Friday night service is not the same as our Saturday service. So please don't miss out on this 24 hour experience known as the Shabbat. I'd like to encourage you also to stay, break bread with one another, uh, share a cup of chicken soup, maybe a piece of challah bread and a kind word with one another. Encourage each other to love and good works. As we say the bedtime Shema, we want to make sure that our hearts are in the right place, that there is no negativity, that there's no resentment, that it's a heart filled with forgiveness, so that our prayers will rise up as sweet incense to the throne of grace. Okay, here we go. Sovereign of the universe, before I sleep, I forgive all who have angered me, upset, or sinned against my honor, honor body, work, or all that's mine, whether willful, careless, accidental, purpose or through their speech, by word or by deed in this world or other worlds, let no one be punished for my wrong. May it be your will I not sin again towards you, that I may not do wrong in your sight. May any wrongs I've done be erased in your great mercy, not through any punishment or pain. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable before you, my Redeemer and my Rock. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod Malchut Olam Ba'ed. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Laila Tov, we'll see you in the morning.